Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're tuning in from across the state of Florida, perhaps even across the country, maybe even overseas. So thank you for joining us today. My name is Krista Ellis. I'm the Community Programs Manager serving the Florida and Gulf Coast chapters with the Parkinson's Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to our event today featuring Carly Rush from the University of Florida. We'll be talking about on the menu, nutrition and Parkinson's disease. I'm tuning in from Tampa, Florida, and I know we're reaching all the corners of Florida today. So feel free to type in the chat or in the Q&A total. To let us know where you are joining us from today. Before I introduce our expert, I'd like to share a few things about the Parkinson's Foundation. The Parkinson's Foundation hosts virtual events each Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of the week. Each Mindful Monday, we practice a different topic of mindful meditation with our Parkinson's community. Each Wellness Wednesday, we explore topics of most importance to you. And of course, each Friday, we feature a fitness class specific to Parkinson's disease, health, and exercise. You can learn more and to register for our PD Health at Home virtual events. Visit parkinson.org backslash PD Health. The Parkinson's Foundation provides families with free resources, including our website, parkinson.org educational books, webinars, podcasts, a hospitalization kit, and our toll-free helpline 1-800-4-PD-INFO, which is staffed by bilingual Parkinson's specialists. Please do not hesitate to reach out to our helpline staff for any Parkinson's support you may need. We are here for you. Don't forget to tune into next week's Mindfulness Monday with me in our mindful Parkinson's community. To start your week with calmness as you take part in guided relaxation techniques to help boost brain power and to reduce stress. This coming Monday, we will be practicing a loving kindness mindful meditation. You can sign up at parkinson.org backslash PD Health. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's event. Carly Rush. Carly received a bachelor's degree in food science and human nutrition from the University of Florida and remained at UF to complete her master's degree in dietetic internship. After becoming a dietitian and working at Advent Health in Orlando, Carly was recruited to move back to UF to work towards a PhD in nutritional sciences. She facilitates an outpatient nutrition program at the UF Health Norman Fixel Institute for Neurological Diseases. Currently, Carly primarily splits her time between clinical care and research. Her research focus is related to the role of diet and gastrointestinal health and neurological diseases. Carly, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely, thank you so much for having me. I'm going to move over this way and share my screen. Um, I hope everyone has some food in their bellies or maybe some food in front of them for this on the menu today, since we're doing it at a lunch hour. I got some food in me beforehand too. But yeah, so thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'm really excited. Um, if you were at our event last September, I've, I'll have some similar information, but I'm also gonna add to it about some of the current research that we have been doing here at UF too. So um, if you see some similar inf information, don't worry, th stay tuned. There'll be some new stuff later. So the objectives of the presentation today are, um, by the end of it, I'm going to discuss some basics of nutrition and how foods impact people with Parkinson's. I also hope you will be able to understand the importance of healthy eating for people with Parkinson's and how some foods may promote brain health and understand the relationship of meal timing and food interaction with Parkinson's medication. And then lastly, some of the newer information I'm going to present are learning the connection between the brain and the gut and how it relates to Parkinson's today. All right, so I think before we get into um, all the nitty gritty about nutrition, I think it's so important to review some of the basics and just get some like clear understanding of what certain definitions of nutrition mean. So nutrition as a definition is the process of providing or obtaining the food necessary for health and growth. It also refers to a branch of science um, that I'm in that studies how nutrients and food impact health and metabolism. So when we think about nutrition, we often 
um, connotate it to the word diet, but the actual word diet refers to the kinds of foods that a person, animal, or even just a community as a whole habitually eats. And so I wanted to review some of um, the different definitions of ma certain macronutrients and micronutrients and other food com components. So what macronutrients are, um, are food, um, food nutrient, nutrients that provide energy for our body to function. So this isn't what the term calorie comes from. So these macronutrients provide a source of calories. And the three main macronutrients are gonna be your proteins, carbs, and fats. So protein foods are gonna be your classic meats, chicken, poultry, even eggs, dairy, um, and nuts, legumes, and seeds. Carbohydrate foods are gonna be your fruits, vegetables, whole grains, uh, and fats are gonna be those um, sources of oils and nuts that you'll find in the diet. Next, we have micronutrients. So what a micronutrient is uh, are, they provide little to no energy, but they are essential building blocks for our metabolism, meaning that we can't function without them, right? So um, a lot of times people like to refer um, vitamin, vitamins and minerals as they think of them particularly more so as supplements, but you'll find these micronutrients in all the different um, types of foods that you'll eat throughout the day. And then other food components that are also beneficial to our health are gonna be dietary fibers and phytonutrients too. So how does nutrition and the food we eat impact Parkinson's? I get this question all the time when I talk to patients in clinic. So the analogy that I like to use is nutrition really acts as the fuel for our body to function. So if we think about um, our body, it's kind of similar to a car. We use the food that we eat as fuel. And we know that our cars can't work its best without gas and a good oil change, right? So what you put in affects what you get out. And the same thing it, um, is with nutrition too. So when it comes to um, Parkinson's, a poor diet overall can lead to fatigue. So you might have decreased appetite, not really interested in preparing meals at home. And when you experience these type of symptoms, um, it's really easy to turn to those comfort foods that are high in calories and fat and low in nutrient dense proteins, vitamins, and minerals. And when we don't consume enough of those nutrient dense foods, because maybe like we're fatigued, we don't feel as great throughout the day, it kind of feeds into this vicious cycle of we're not fueling ourselves with the right nutrition. So then we continue to not feel great, right? Um, and then a poor diet can also lead to malnutrition and or obesity too. So maybe struggling with unintentional weight loss or um, weight gain throughout someone's life. We also know poor nutrition can impact our gut health, um, AKA constipation, which um, quite often a lot of people with Parkinson's suffer from. We also know it can lead to dehydration. So um, I talk about food a lot in clinic, but often we, we tend to forget about how important fluids are and drinking enough fluids throughout the day is really important for um, coating the lining of our organs and tissues and making sure we keep our kidneys healthy too. And then overall, when we're dealing with a lot of these symptoms because um, of poor nutrition or the symptoms are leading to um, worse nutrition, overall it can really reduce our quality of life too. We know in Parkinson's that a poor diet um, may even increase severity of um, Parkinson's symptoms, whether it's motor or non-motor, and increase our risk of other chronic diseases. And then some other considerations that we want to think about are the way food and the medications someone might be taking interact too. All right, so this is the time for the poll. So um, I want you to think about what is the best diet for Parkinson's, maybe that you've heard about. Is it the ketogenic diet, a Mediterranean diet, maybe gluten-free or just depends on the person?
All right, so it looks like a lot of you um, think the Mediterranean diet is the best diet for people with Parkinson's. Um, I will, you're not wrong, but let me exit out of this. Overall, I would say it really depends on the person. So whenever I'm talking to people in clinic, I always like to say that the best diet is the one that works for you and your individual needs, because we know everyone is different. So when someone comes into our clinic here, we always say, if you've treated one person with Parkinson's, you've treated one person with Parkinson's, everyone is so unique in their symptoms and their experience. So just, because, just like we don't treat someone with Parkinson's the same over the course of their life, I don't feel that nutrition should be approached the same either. But you're like, okay, but I came for something, Carly, right? So, um, but if I had to pick one, I would pick overall the Mediterranean diet. And so we hear a lot about the Mediterranean diet in the news. We, I know it's been rated number one diet based on the US News and World Report in 2020 and just in years uh, before that too. And that's because the Mediterranean diet has really been shown to be beneficial for heart disease, stroke, cancer. It's been shown to be beneficial for keeping a healthy weight or even promoting weight loss, diabetes. Um, it's been shown to be beneficial for our brain health and possibly even beneficial for people with Parkinson's. So what is a Mediterranean diet? So a Mediterranean diet is um, foods that consist of high consumption of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts and legumes. So I like to kind of, I like to discuss it as a plant-based diet, but it also has higher amounts of fish and, and olive oil too. And then lower amounts um, of red meat, butter, margarine, processed foods or sweets. So just a generally healthy diet. And I know when, when it comes to diet and nutrition, people like to um, like visuals and food pyramid visuals have always kind of been a mainstay in the nutrition world. So this is the Mediterranean diet food pyramid. So at the bottom of the food pyramid, which I find really um, great that is there, is not even nutrition related because overall, the Mediterranean diet isn't just a diet, it's an overall lifestyle um, that we try to promote here. So at the bottom of the pyramid, the actual biggest emphasis is around movement, physical activity, um, social so socializing with family, friends. I know right now during the pandemic, it's a little bit more difficult to do that, but in any form or way we can have that social interaction is beneficial for our health. And when it comes to physical activity, that could range um, from a number of things. And I always say whatever, um, the best physical activity is the one that you like to do the best. And then the mainstay of the, Mediter the Mediterranean diet pyramid is gonna be those plant-based foods, as I mentioned before. So that's gonna be um, your fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, olives, and, um, and healthy um, sources of fats too. And then as we move up into the pyramid, that's where we'll find the um, protein sources of foods, which with the Mediterranean diet highly emphasizes fish and seafood with moderate amounts of poultry, eggs, cheese, and yogurt. And at the very tippy top, very little meats and sweets. Doesn't mean you can't ever have it, just means eating it a little less often. And like I said, just as foods are important, fluids are important as well. So the Mediterranean diet emphasizes drinking plenty of water throughout the day. And if you are, if you do drink alcohol, drinking red wine in moderation. If you don't drink alcohol, we always say don't start. And another thing I like to um, talk about with my, when I see people here in clinic is I like to emphasize that it's a not a one size fits all approach. So whenever we think about the Mediterranean diet, we think a lot about dishes that are made in Greece and Italy and Spain, um, but sometimes we don't always eat that way, right? 
So a Mediterranean diet is very adaptable to based on the foods that you prefer and can eat too. So you have here in the first picture, a roasted chicken and vegetable dish. So this is emphasizing carrots, potatoes, and herbs. In the middle picture, we have a shrimp coconut curry dish. And then in the third picture here is that more traditional Mediterranean diet dish. So the reason why I show you this is that all of these different um, cuisines or meals can be incorporated into a Mediterranean diet lifestyle. So like I said, um, really emphasizing the importance of a dietary pattern. So what a dietary pattern means is, um, so the, the USDA in 2015 shifted away from focusing so much on single nutrients that people should consume more of and less of, and really focus more on the overall pattern of foods that we eat in a day. So, and what I mean by that is the totality of all the foods that we eat, right? So um, really focusing on dietary patterns versus just a diet. And like I mentioned before, healthy eating patterns are adaptable and um, it'll be the totality of all the foods and beverages you consume. And so just to go into a little bit of the health benefits. So I told you about what the Mediterranean diet is. I kind of alluded to some health benefits, but now I'm gonna go in a little bit more detail here. So what it, um, the health benefits are, it's thought to be an anti-inflammatory diet because it has a high amount of antioxidants from plant foods. So what, what antioxidants are, are they kind of act as these little scavenger molecules that help either prevent or slow damage to our body cells. Because of the emphasis of fish and seafood, uh, the Mediterranean diet um, has a high amount of omega-3 fatty acids from the diet. And these omega-3s are essential dietary fats that are known to influence brain health and function too. We also know that the Mediterranean diet is high in dietary fiber from plant foods. And so what dietary fiber essentially is, um, is non-digestible carbohydrates. So foods that um, pass our stomach and our small intestine, and they can influence our gut health and even our immune function too. So some studies on the Mediterranean diet have shown that they can, that a Mediterranean diet could lower that bad cholesterol, so LDL, and increase levels of uh, good cholesterol, so that HDL. It's also been shown to lower blood pressure, prevent heart disease and stroke, and even reduce symptoms of depression too. And when it comes to brain health, I won't talk too much on the literature, so much on the literature right now on this, but I thought this slide would be really beneficial to show you. So uh, these researchers way back in 2015 published an article where they followed people, um, it was about over 300 people, about average age of 65 years old. It was done in Spain and they targeted people who were at high risk for heart disease. And this was an interventional study, meaning that they assigned randomly um, three different groups for um, three and three different diets for people to consume. And it, the groups were either a Mediterranean diet that emphasized extra virgin olive oil, a Mediterranean diet with nuts, or the control group, which was just your standard low fat diet that is generally recommended by the American Heart Association. And people followed this diet for about four ish, four to five years. And what um, I think is important to highlight here is that uh, the Mediterranean diet, both in the extra virgin olive oil and the nuts group, they found that when looking at scores for memory, cognition, and just overall um, brain health like function, they found that the Mediterranean diet in either group was superior for preserving brain health than, over time than the controlled diet group, which I think is pretty cool. And 
I know we're here um, not just for brain health in general, but also to get more information on Parkinson's too. So more research is actually being conducted in Parkinson's. However, um, like I mentioned, the last study that I showed you was a intervention study. So they assigned people to follow a diet. Very few studies have actually done diet interventions to either improve motor or non-motor symptoms in people with Parkinson's. However, when researchers have done some uh, research looking in the past, so a retrospective study, they found that a Mediterranean diet pattern may help reduce someone's risk for developing Parkinson's, possibly delay the age of um, onset, and maybe even reduce symptoms of constipation, which I'll talk about a little bit later too. But I always say the Mediterranean diet is just one tool in the toolbox for people with Parkinson's because sometimes following a global diet and lifestyle change isn't always um, necessary or um, warranted in someone with Parkinson's. So what about um, if someone has a food and drug interaction? So. Um, my next poll question I want to ask you all is, what is the macronutrient that may cause an interaction with Parkinson's medication? So that carbidopa, levodopa, or cinnamet? So is it... I know we talked about macronutrients before, so we have carbohydrates, we have proteins, we have fats, or is it maybe all of the above? All right. So it looks like a majority of you um, believe it's protein. And then maybe in, a in second place is the all of the above group. Well, we'll see on the next slide. Oh. So similar to my diet polling, my answer to this question is the same. So it depends. Um, so what cinnamon is, that carbidopa levodopa? It's a medication used to treat Parkinson's, particularly treating, making to produce more dopamine, that neurotransmitter that controls our overall movement, right? So dietary proteins are often referred to as the main food drug interaction to the medication cinnamon. And this is because uh, proteins may compete with levodopa for absorption in our gut, as well as in our brain. Uh, if we, depending on the person, if uh, it could lead to delayed on time and early wearing off, if there is an interaction. But in general, we typically do see this occur after 10 years of diagnosis or when medication response is unpredictable. So in practice, in clinic, uh, I always tell people there's a broad spectrum of protein cinnamon interactions when it comes to food medication timing. Um, I have some people that can take their medication with their meals. They don't notice any difference. And then I have other people on the other end of the spectrum who feel like they'll look at protein and they feel like they're wearing off. So it depends. But I know protein gets a lot of the attention when it comes to food and drug interactions, but um, there are some other potential food interactions with cinnamon. So in someone with Parkinson's, often their uh, people experience delayed stomach emptying. So if we look at the picture of our stomach here, if someone has delayed emptying um, of contents from the stomach into their intestine, this could delay or decrease the absorption of levodopa. And there are nutrients, other nutrients besides proteins that delay stomach emptying. 
So um, we also can see delayed emptying um, in high fat meals, as well as certain forms of dietary fibers too. Um, and this may explain um, decreased effectiveness if maybe you were to eat out at a restaurant and you have a big meal. I know this was a one question that someone asked during our symposium last year. They told me, why is it every time I go to the Olive Garden, I always feel like my medication doesn't work as effectively. And so I asked him, I was like, okay, well, what do you typically order? Oh, the big pasta dish, maybe some, um, some breadsticks, a salad. And the quantity and the amount of fat and protein at that meal overall um, led to that delayed stomach emptying, so delayed absorption of his medication. So sometimes we sh um, shouldn't be focusing so much on protein, but maybe the, con the other contents and the size of the meal too. But overall, when it comes to some general recommendations for taking um, Cinemet, I always like to recommend, take, if you can, take it on an empty stomach 30 minutes before meals or one to two hours after a meal. And you can adjust this timing as needed, depending on the effectiveness and preferred schedule too. So some people can tolerate foods and others may need a little bit more time fasted. And just remember, everyone is different. And that's kind of like the theme of this talk and all of my talks will be. So just because it works for someone doesn't always mean it's gonna work for you. Um, I, another common question that I do get in clinic is, okay, well, what if I can't take it on an empty stomach? I get really nauseous. So my trick for dealing with this is to pair cinnamon with a simple carbohydrate. So the reason why I emphasize simple carbohydrates are um, because it's quickly digested and it's less likely to delay that stomach emptying. So some examples could be uh, drinking some, like a, just a quarter to a half a cup of juice, maybe a little bit of soda or ginger ale, white bread, crackers. Uh, I had one lady who would eat an Eggo waffle every morning with a little bit of jam with her medication and that seemed to do the trick. Now, it, for people who are a little bit, maybe a more advanced and have more issues with their medication effectiveness, a protein redistribution diet may be warranted. So what this means is the greatest amount of protein in your diet is shifted to the time of day where interaction is the lowest. So typically that's in the evenings. So I often find if someone does need to redistribute the amount of protein in their meals, if they have a larger protein meal in the evening, it doesn't necessarily affect them as much as if they had it earlier in the day because they're just gonna go to sleep. Now, that may not be the case for you. It's gonna be, to be dependent on the person. And that's why I like to always recommend overall that you either meet with your doctor and even a registered dietitian too to discuss a more tailored approach to meet your needs because um, oftentimes I will get people who are just completely scared of protein because of the potential interaction with their medication. And a low protein diet or it often leads to just a general low um, calorie diet. And that can really increase your risk for uninten unintentional weight loss and malnutrition that can lead to increased risk of falling, infections, and even hospitalization too. So meeting with a doctor and a dietitian is really important to figure out what um, are the best approaches for what your needs are. All right, so now I'm gonna actually kind of switch a little bit of gears compared to um, the last time I spoke. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the digestive system and Parkinson's and even um, give everyone a um, sneak peek into the research that we've been doing here at UF. So I stole this slide from one of Dr. Martin's previous presentations, but I thought it does a really good job of explaining all the different ways um, the GI tract can be impacted in someone with Parkinson's. So starting from the top, the salivary glands. So um, someone can have decreased saliva production or drooling that might make it more difficult to eat certain foods. 
Um, if you have um, tremor or rigidity in your jaw, it could lead to tooth damage or just issues chewing as well. In the, in the esophagus right here, so dopamine is a neurotransmitter that's not only important for our brain health and function that controls our movements, but it also can, is a neurotransmitter that controls the movement of contents throughout our intestinal tract too. So with less dopamine around, someone could have issues uh, with swallowing because of altered um, function of the, um, the lining of the GI tract. Like I mentioned previously, um, in the stomach, we could have delayed gastric emptying, which can lead to early satiety, meaning that I, you get full, full fuller um, earlier, as well as nausea and then just decreased appetite and weight loss. In the small intestine, that could be affected by um, that slow transit because we don't have as much of that dopamine to move things along. And that slow transit could lead to abdominal distension or bloating, which could lead to a bacterial overgrowth or malabsorption and weight loss. But um, with my research, I'm actually particularly interested in the large intestine and in people with Parkinson's and how that slow transit time impacts constipation symptoms, bloating, gas, et cetera. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about constipation and Parkinson's. So we know that constipation is present in, in up to 80% of people with Parkinson's. And it's the most, it's one of the most common non-motor symptoms. Now, when it comes to managing constipation, right now, our current recommendations are kind of basic. And what I mean by that, it's just increase your dietary fiber, increase your fluids, exercise. And if those things don't work out for you, then uh, you can try some bulk producing laxatives, meaning um, they're insoluble fibers that add more bulk to the stool. So that'll be things like Metamucil, Fibercon, or Citrusel. People are often recommended to take stool softeners like Docusake or Docolax. And then we also, um, you also can take some osmotic laxatives like Miralax. And um, if someone's constipation symptoms are pretty severe, they might even need to resort to a prescription medication. Um, and commonly here, what we see is uh, the one Linzesk. And we know that overall, these management strategies are good, but they're not always perfect and they don't always work for everyone. And um, when it comes to constipation, we know that um, people who do experience constipation, it's associated with changes in their gut health or their microbiome. Now you're like, okay, well, what is the microbiome? I hear about it a lot. Maybe you read some like news articles or blogs. We all hear about gut health. We all know maybe that there's some bacteria in there and that's important, but what is, that, what is it exactly? So the gut microbiome, the definition of it is the totality of all the microorganisms and their genetic material that are present in the GI tract. And so when I refer to gut microbiota, that I'm referring to the microorganisms or like the bacteria in the, in the GI tract. And previous studies have found that the bacteria or the gut, the gut microbiota can produce what's called short chain fatty acids. So these SFAs, right? And what's really important about these short chain fatty acids are that they work as signaling molecules that influence our gut health and immune function. And I would say over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of attention now with the microbiome and Parkinson's disease. And that's because previous studies have found Lewy bodies, so that aggregated protein that's often referred to as a buildup in the brain in someone with Parkinson's. So they found these Lewy bodies all along the GI tract in people with Parkinson's. And it really has researchers thinking, does Parkinson's spread from the brain to the gut? Or maybe it's the gut to the brain. But this um, is really still up for debate. 
However, more recent research has um, come out showing that there are changes in the gut bacteria uh, in multiple studies that have looked in people with Parkinson's. And what they found is that these decreased beneficial bacteria and increased um, abundance of what the, we would refer to as pathogenic pa bacteria are associated with inflammation in the gut, which often we kind of hear as leaky gut. And it's even these changes in bacteria are even associated with constipation as well. So when it comes to diet in the microbiome, I always like to say, well, we are what we eat. So the foods that we eat really do shape the makeup and function of our gut microbiome. And those bacteria that are living within our gut, they're going to utilize whatever energy source is present too. So they can utilize fiber and, uh, and lesser amounts of proteins, et cetera. And the bacterial gut microbiota can also produce certain vitamins as well, like thiamine, folate, vitamin K. And um, more on the beneficial side, these bacteria can break down dietary fibers to produce those sh beneficial short chain fatty acids that I talked about previously. They also can cross feed off each other. So if one bacteria is producing one short chain fatty acid, another bacteria can come in, utilize that as an energy source and produce another short chain fatty acid. So it's a whole ecosystem that's happening within there. And um, previous studies have shown that actually a Mediterranean diet is associated with more beneficial bacteria when looking at, at healthy people. So at UF, um, since I'm also a doctoral student here doing research, my ultimate research question has really been, can we use certain diets like the Mediterranean diet to improve outcomes like gut health and immune function in people with Parkinson's. Because remember, I told you previously, few studies have actually investigated diet intervention in people with Parkinson's. Most of the research is observational and it's really limited on how much we can apply that to the general population. So I wanna give you all a sneak preview of some of the uh, data that we've collected here at UF. So in 2019, we conducted a pilot study or a feasibility study at the University of Florida. And this was sponsored by the UF Moonshot Grant. It was um, taken part in conjunction with the Norman Fixel Institute and the Food Science and Human Nutrition Department. And we recruited eight people with Parkinson's to participate in the study. So it's a pretty small study. And what they did was um, we had them consume a Mediterranean diet for five weeks. And because the sample size was so small, we didn't really um, have the ability to implement a control group yet. But during the study, these people completed questionnaires on bowel function, diet, and non-motor symptoms. And we also collected stool samples from them too. So um, I wanted to show you some of the data that we found. So, as I mentioned previously, a Mediterranean diet is high in dietary fiber and dietary fiber can be beneficial for our gut health. So after the five week diet intervention, we found that um, over on average, which you can see by this dotted red line here, our participants fiber intake significantly increased. Now they kind of started off on average a little high, so around 25 grams, but we got them um, to consume on average 11 grams more of fiber per day on this Mediterranean diet. We also measured their adherence to a med Mediterranean diet using this questionnaire. And I often like to utilize this questionnaire in practice in clinic too. So it's 14 questions and it's just a yes, no. So it'll ask things like, do you consume olive oil as a main culinary fat? How much do you consume per day? Vegetable servings, fruit servings, et cetera. So overall, people who score 10 out of 14 points are considered to have good adherence. 
So you can see at the beginning of the study, people ranged from one to six on this scale of Mediterranean diet adherence. So they're not really following a Mediterranean diet at home. But after five weeks, as expected, we found that Mediterranean diet adherence significantly increased um, af after um, the, from baseline to five weeks of the intervention. And that's expected, but th this is important because it shows that it is feasible in people with Parkinson's. We also um, conducted questionnaires throughout the study. And I'm gonna highlight one of them that we did, which is this gastrointestinal symptom rating scale. And what I like about this scale is it incorporates all components of gastrointestinal function. So abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, indigestion, and reflux. And it's scored on a one to seven scale. So one meaning no discomfort to seven meaning very severe discomfort. And the reason why I like this scale too is it incorporates different components of constipation. So sometimes constip uh, we just think about constipation as a whole, but we also often forget about hard stools that are a symptom associated with constipation, as well as the feeling of just incomplete evacuation from the bowel too. And so I'm only gonna highlight the constipation syndrome scores because I found them the most interesting. So on average at baseline, our participants had experienced about slight level of constipation. Now we did have a few that were in that moderate level as well. But what we found was that after five weeks, those constipation symptoms significantly improved and almost normalized too. We also looked at the consistency of the stool. So like I said, um, the hardness of the stool really matters. And we showed that um, the consistency improved from baseline to week five, suggesting faster intestinal transit. So the stool isn't sitting in the colon as long as it needs to. We also um, saw changes in some members of bacteria after the five week diet intervention. So we saw increases of bacteria that are known to produce short chain fatty acids like this one called Roseburia. We also saw decreases in pathogenic bacteria um, that are less beneficial to our health, um, such as this bacteria um, called Bilophilia. But because it was such a small sample size, it really makes it dif difficult to see huge global changes in the microbiome. And notably, we also saw weight and BMI decrease significantly after the diet intervention. And some people might think, oh, well, this is good. Most people are overweight. Like, shouldn't we be promoting weight loss? However, people forget that weight loss may or may not be warranted in someone with Parkinson's. And if you're already underweight and you or you struggle to maintain your weight, Following a Mediterranean diet, if it is really shown to promote weight loss, it actually could increase your risk for malnutrition. So these results really emphasize the importance of um, how weight and body composition monitoring should be considered in future research studies. And just in general, the importance of those tailored diet interventions based on individual needs. Just because my research is focused on the Mediterranean diet, doesn't mean I think that everyone should be follow, following the Mediterranean diet, particularly in those who really do struggle to maintain their weight. So overall, the conclusions from our pilot study were that a Mediterranean diet intervention is feasible in people with Parkinson's and it could potentially reduce symptoms of constipation and modulate the gut microbiota. It also may result in unintended reductions in weight. However, when I explain these results to you, I really want to highlight the importance of the limitations of the study. So um, it's a very small sample size. It's uh, right now it can't be generalized to the public. There wasn't a control group, meaning that there was there's increased risk of bias in the results. And it was a short term study, so it was only five weeks long. We don't know um, how these changes may be impacted over a longer term, like six months, a year or more. 
But overall, larger randomized controlled trials are really warranted to further test the efficacy of a Mediterranean diet on GI function, as well as just clarify those risks of weight loss. So with more nutrition research, we can really develop better guidelines and recommendations for practice too. And um, I was given permission to do a little plug for my research study. So um, based off the pilot study, we actually have now um, used that data to formulate a larger um, randomized control trial in people with Parkinson's. So we're actually going to be targeting people with Parkinson's who experience at least slight constipation symptoms. So we're calling it the MediPD trial. And um, I know not everyone is in Florida, but if you are in Florida and you're kind of within a driving distance to Gainesville, we're, um, the trial is going to be located here in Gainesville, Florida. And there's only going to be three in-person appointments about one and a half to two to three hours long over a 10 week period. And then the other study procedures that we're going to be doing are going to be virtually or by phone. And this is going to be a 10 week study to determine if the Mediterranean diet impacts GI function of people diagnosed with Parkinson's and who experience at least slight constipation symptoms. We'll now have an inner uh, control group. So our control group will receive standard of care for constipation, which just includes a handout with some of those recommendations I mentioned previously. And then the intervention group is going to receive the same standard of care, but also Mediterranean diet education. And now what I've been telling people in the control group, I tell them like, don't get too discouraged if you're in the control group. There's a value to your participation in this study. And once the study is completed, we're going to offer you the Mediterranean diet if you'd like afterwards too. So some basic eligibility are, um, we're looking for people 40 to 85 years old, diagnosed with Parkinson's and experienced like constipation. We're also looking for people who are not considered underweight, so have a BMI of greater than 18.5. Um, you can't have a history of DBS or a um, pre-existing GI condition or disease. And then there also be additional criteria. Participants throughout the study will receive compensation, a light breakfast at study visits, diet education by a dietitian like myself uh, with weekly phone calls. And then as well as we're going to be doing body composition assessments, which you can see me here down below getting my body composition measured. So if this is something that interests you and um, you want more information about it, I'll really encourage you to uh, go to our screening questionnaire link, which is um, this tinyurl.com slash MPD study, or give us a call at 352-340-7321. And from there, we'll be able to give a little bit more information about the study and the criteria um, to participate as well. So for the callers that are listening, the website is tiny, so T-I-N-Y-U-R-L dot com slash M as in Mediterranean, and then PD as in Parkinson's disease study, or you can call 352-340-7321. And then to, uh, to conclude the talk today, I'll just kind of summarize what we discussed. So number one, nutrition acts as that our fuel for our body to function. There's really no single best diet for people with Parkinson's, and that's because everyone has different needs and preferences. People with Parkinson's may need to monitor food drug interactions with their medications, but you should really ask your doctor or a registered dietitian for help. And the Mediterranean diet is a healthy diet that may improve brain and gut health in people with Parkinson's. But more research is needed and participate in research if you can. And then with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Carly. Uh, we have a lot of questions. <laughs> 
but I want to start with um, there's two questions that have seemed to come up quite a lot. Um, so we'll start with protein. Lots of our um, attendance today, people are asking more specifics about protein. And I know that we covered it in your presentation, but we're looking more um, at if you could describe how protein is related to carbidopa levodopa, um, talking about absorption of the levodopa in the gut, timing um, between ingesting protein and what that means for carbidopa levodopa, how much protein do we need? How little can we eat? Just giving us, you know, a really nice thorough rundown of protein and the relationship to carbidopa levodopa. Perfect. Okay, so protein shares similar transporters in our gut for absorption. Um, and what that means is that if we share, if protein shares a similar transporter in the gut, that means that they could potentially compete for absorption. And if they're competing for absorption, that might mean that levodopa might not work as effectively. However, it's not as simple as just saying like, okay, protein and levodopa compete, therefore I need to avoid it or um, time my meals correctly. And that's just because you don't always see this half, uh, you don't always see decreased effectiveness, particularly early on when someone started on levodopa. So early on, I don't usually recommend me spacing out your medication with your meals unless you are having a interaction. And what I mean by an interaction, I mean um, decreased wearing off or um, you don't feel like your medication is um, kicking on as effectively or those dyskinesias, which is that uncontrolled movement too. So early on, when someone starts levodopa, they might not, they might have a good response to their medication and they don't notice a difference if they take it with a meal or without. But once you've been on it for five, 10, maybe more years, you might start to notice a difference. And when you do, that's when I start recommending, okay, let's try taking it on that empty stomach. If you get nauseous, pair it with that simple carb, maybe it's a cracker, an ego waffle, like one of my patients loves to do, and see if that helps. And then eat your meal 30 minutes at least later. If uh, it's coming after a meal, try to space it out about two hours too, okay? And then when it comes to the amount of protein, that's really gonna depend on the person too. So in general, um, just to kind of throw out some numbers, um, the recommended amount of protein that we should be consuming just at a baseline. So that just means that to sustain overall health and function. So that adequate level is typically going to be about 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. So I know we don't always measure ourselves in kilograms. Um, we measure ourselves in pounds. The conversion from pounds to kilograms is that you divide it by 2.2 if we have some numbers people out there. So I don't like to give like a general recommendation just because, uh, or specific numbers, just because it's really gonna depend on your height, your size, but it could range from 50 to 80 grams of protein in a day, depending on the person. However, I'll say that's the adequate amount. Now, in people who um, are older, we know that um, we lose just muscle tone over time. So eating that 0.8 grams um, per kilo per day might not be adequate enough or optimal enough to promote muscle um, gain and strength and prevent muscle loss. So sometimes people actually might need a little bit more. Maybe it's one gram per kilo or 1.2 grams per kilo. So I know a lot of people want those specific numbers and that's one of the challenges is, you know, the unique qualities of Parkinson's disease and our own mm -hmm. bodies. So um, I appreciate, you know, emphasizing that, you know, we're all so different and we need to really address our own bodies and our specific needs to identify what we need mm -hmm. personally. Absolutely. 
So another question that um, was repeated over and over again was about sugar and processed foods. So we have many questions on, you know, what are the implications of sugar, artificial sweetener on um, <laughs> nutrition itself, but also on Parkinson's disease and the relationship between the brain and sugar. So trying to understand how sugar influences our nutrition. Mm -hmm. So overall, having too much sugar in our diet is not going to be beneficial for health, right? So it could lead to in, just increased in, intake of processed foods overall can lead to just ha consuming more calorically dense foods. So foods that have a lot of calories and energy, but very little nutrients too, right? And that could increase our risk for weight gain, obesity, as well as other chronic diseases like heart disease, diabetes, et cetera. Now, when it comes to sugar and Parkinson's, there haven't been a lot of research out there that I've looked at that specifically. There has been some retrospective studies that have looked at if you consume maybe more processed foods, are you more at risk of developing Parkinson's? And sure, absolutely. But if you eat processed foods and sugar, you're at risk for developing a whole bunch of other chronic diseases too. So I wouldn't say um, as from, to my knowledge, there's any specific links with sugar and Parkinson's, but I just like to um, give recommendations about sugar from like an overall health standpoint. And I thought that in this question was um, good to ask how sugar affects our mood. Yeah. So um, it depends, right? So um, oftentimes we turn to sugar um, when we're feeling down or kind of fatigued. Um, and we think that it's going to actually make us feel better. It may temporarily make us feel better, but overall it's going to still contribute to that vicious cycle of fatigue and feeling um, just not so great because we're not fueling our body with those nutrient dense foods and we're fueling it more with those processed high sugar foods. I wanted to make sure that we addressed um, more about gut health and the relation between prebiotics and probiotics and what that means for nutrition. Yeah. So um, I didn't define prebiotics and probiotics, but I'll do that now. So um, because I know they can kind of sound similar and confusing. So a prebiotic are, um, so I talked about the bacteria in our gut and how they can utilize different energy sources, right, to produce either beneficial signal, signaling molecules like those short chain fatty acids, or they could utilize um, less beneficial energy sources like proteins and produce uh, more pathogenic bacteria that aren't so good for our gut health. So prebiotics are non-digestible food components. So we often think about prebiotics as fiber, but it doesn't have to be fiber. It cannot be other um, nutrients or food components in the diet. And it can be considered a prebiotic if it is utilized by the bacteria in our gut to produce a health benefit to the host. And what I mean by host, I mean by us, um, <laughs> the bacteria that lives in our gut. And then a probiotic are actual live bacteria that we can ingest, whether it's in a food or a supplement that can influence and change the composition of our gut to produce a health benefit. So like I said, we have like some bacteria in our gut that like to cross feed. So even if we um, consume a probiotic itself, sure, we'll see increases of that bacteria in our gut, but we also might see some changes in other bacteria just because we're influencing the members of that ecosystem within the gut. So in people with Parkinson's, as of now, there aren't too many good recommendations just yet on what prebiotics or probiotics to consume. I know there's been a couple recently published animal studies looking at probiotics and um, how that influence maybe our um, motor function in, in um, a Parkinson's animal model. Um, however, the data is still really preliminary and we're not, it, I wouldn't say it's ready yet to utilize as a general recommendation. However, 
prebiotics have been shown to be very beneficial for improving symptoms of constipation, as well as promoting healthy bacteria in our gut. So from like a general standpoint, I would say increasing our intake from prebiotic foods. So that could be um, foods that contain um, like fiber one bars. So they contain inulin, which is a very commonly known prebiotic. Um, other foods that have um, added prebiotics like yogurts or even just foods, um, whole foods in the diet, like fruits and vegetables and whole grains. Um, by consuming more of those prebiotic fibers, that could really um, benefit our gut health, maybe even improve constipation, as well as um, influencing those beneficial bacteria in the gut. Great, thanks. I need to start taking more prebiotics. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, and I forgot to say too, um, a lot of people try to take probiotics for constipation. And I will say that the data on it, probiotics alone without a prebiotic for constipation isn't really strong. So um, just picking up a probiotic off the shelf is probably not going to influence your constipation symptoms too much. You really need to make sure that you have that prebiotic fiber as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Carly. Really appreciate the time today. I know we have so many questions um, around nutrition and Parkinson's disease, and I want to encourage everyone to reach out to the Parkinson's Foundation's helpline at 1-800-4-PD-INFO. And Carly, um, I just wanted to ask before I uh, put it out there, are you and other staff members of the neurological dietitian team doing telehealth practice right now? Yes, uh, we are. Um, however, we're only offering it to patients of the Fixel Institute right now. Okay. So um, if you're not a patient of the Fixel Institute, but you hear a lot about it, and maybe you want to come see one of the neurologists here and then myself, definitely would recommend it. Um, we see people from all over. But unfortunately, right now, I'm only limited to um, patients of the Fixel Institute. Okay. So I would encourage um, everyone tuning in today to reach out to the UF Norman Fixell Institute to become a, an established patient um, with the neurology and movement disorder team there. They're an absolutely phenomenal team of experts uh, for Parkinson's disease. So please, 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 please reach out to them. Um, and thank you, Carly, for all your time today, for sharing your knowledge with us. I sincerely appreciate it. Of course. Thank you for having me again. I want to thank our sponsor, AbbVie, for um, supporting our event today on nutrition with Parkinson's disease. We could not have um, our programs without the support of our sponsors. So thank you so much, AbbVie. And of course, a final thank you to our speaker, Carly Rush, and also to all of you for joining us today. We cannot wait until we're able to see you in person again. So until then, please know that our virtual programs are here for you and you can register for upcoming programs at parkinson.org backslash PD health. Today's event has been recorded and will be archived on the Parkinson's Foundation's YouTube channels within the next few days. And a link to the recording of today's presentation will be included in a follow-up email. So please check that inbox, I'd say probably a week. Keep in touch with your local chapter, your Parkinson's Foundation staff by visiting our webpage at parkinson.org backslash Florida or call or reach us at um, an email, Florida at Parkinson. Org. And again, a final thank you to everyone joining us today and to our expert featured speaker, Carly Rush. I really enjoy working with you and um, always learn something new when, when, we, when we have time together. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Goodbye, everyone.